Now turn with me tonight to First Peter. And we'll read the first nine verses together. First Peter chapter one. And we'll read verses one through to nine. Let's hear the word of God. To cast your mind back, a number of years ago, we <coughs> spent, uh, I think, the best part of nearly two years expounding the first epistle of Peter. Let's hear the word of the Lord. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season of need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not yet rejoice, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Amen. We know the Lord will stamp his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. Now my text tonight is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. It reads that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And my subject tonight is entitled The Preciousness of the Trial of Our Faith. Now for a number of weeks we've been thinking about the subject, the precious things of God. And previously I've told you that there are 72 references in the Bible highlighting the things that are most precious unto the Lord. Now that's a lot of references. I've told you that the word precious means something highly valued, something to be greatly esteemed, something that's mostly treasured. And looking back then, a few weeks ago, I preached in the first sermon on this subject, the precious thoughts of God, Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. And what a lovely thought that is, that the living in the true God in heaven is constantly thinking of all his children in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you tonight are in the thoughts of God. And then we looked at the precious word of God, First Samuel 3 and 1, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. And what a precious treasure the word of God is. A word in our own mother tongue, a word we can read, a word that we can hear, a word that's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword to our own souls. We then thought about the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. And the doctrine of the blood lies at the very heart of the gospel. And we were encouraged in the Bible College through Dr. Paisley, late Dr. Paisley, and many other uh, preachers and lecturers to make much of the blood. And then we also thought about the preciousness of faith. 2 Peter 2 and 1. True faith remembers a gift. It's obtained. The object of true faith is always God and God in Christ. And true faith operates or works by the principle of love. 
Then fifthly, we thought about the precious promises of God, 2 Peter 1 and 4. And I've told you, often there are 7,300 promises in the book, all of them very great and precious words from God. Every one of them is yea and amen to us who are in Christ Jesus. And every promise is like a blank check signed by Christ. And we can bring it to the bank of heaven where we can cash it in. Then we thought about the preciousness of redemption. Psalm 49 verses 8 and 9. The precious sons of Zion, Lamentation 4 and 2. A few weeks ago we considered one of the most precious things in the eyes of the Lord, namely the preciousness of Christ. First uh, Peter chapter 2 verse 7. I told you that there, out of the 72 references to the precious things of God in the Bible, seven times the word precious is used by the Apostle Peter. Chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 1, verse 19, chapter 2, 4, chapter 2, 6, and in chapter 2, verse 7. Then in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. The fifth reference is a reference to God's dear Son. Five is the number of grace. And what a gracious, gracious gift the Lord Jesus really is to every believing soul, the one who trusts in his personal work. We can say with Paul, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. And then I think it was about two weeks ago, I preached on one of the most strangest things that are precious in the sight of God, Namely, the death of his saints. For the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. And there is such a thing as the preciousness of the death of the Lord's dear people. Blessed are the dead, the Bible says, which die in the Lord. Now tonight I want to add to the list. And I want us to think about another strange subject. The preciousness of the trial of our faith. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, think of the words that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Is that not a strange way to speak of trials? I would put it to you that when you're experiencing trials, that's not the first word that comes to mind. This is precious. We don't remotely view trials and testing and hardship as precious. And yet the amazing thing is this, that while this is strange to our understanding, this is one of the first seven references to the word precious in First and Second Peter. And it's interesting that Peter, out of the 72 references in the Bible to the precious things of God, highlights seven things that are precious in his sight. Seven remembers the number of perfection. And here's the first, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now I want us to think of three things tonight. And I'm well aware that I've already preached on uh, first epistle of Peter, um, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, uh, a number of years back, and give a very detailed exposition there about our subject, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. So I, I want to look at it maybe from a, a slightly different angle tonight. Let's think first of all of the people that are addressed. If you think of the words, your faith. <coughs> you see, the Apostle Peter is writing to God's people. We must remember the context here in Chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So, so he's writing to strangers, but he doesn't know, people that he never met in person. And he mentions that they're uh, living in at least five geographical areas, five places. And what does he say about these strangers? Look at verse 2. 
They're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. The word elect means that they're chosen. That is, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And they're chosen through sanctification of the Spirit. In other words, they've been separated by the Spirit of God. and They've been born of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So, Peter's really writing to believers. He's writing to God's people. Those who are genuinely and truly saved by the grace of God and are washed in the blood of Christ. To those that have a testimony to the saving and keeping power of Christ. So, so he's addressing God's people. He's addressing believers. And what's he saying to believers? That the trial of your faith. So, so he's writing to people that have faith in Christ. And he's going to tell them something that your faith in Christ is going to be tested. It's going to be proven by trials and hardship and difficulties that come into your life. You see, let me put it this way. Trials and troubles are part and parcel of the Christian life. There's no such thing as having a Christian life without experiencing trials and troubles. I was sharing to a lady on the phone uh, last week, Nahum 1 and 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and knoweth them that trusteth in him. And I was telling her that I remember hearing I only heard him three times, the late Pastor Willie Mullen preached on the subject, the day of trouble. And I remember him saying in the Korean Town Hall that there's a day of trouble comes to us all. And if you link up these words or that thought with 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, we read, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you so some strange thing had happened unto you. Verse 13, But rejoice, inasmuch ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You see, these people that are experiencing this fiery trial were God's people, and they couldn't understand it. This is strange, but, but we're God's people. These things shouldn't be happening to us. But here's the reality of the Christian life. That on the Christian pilgrimage towards heaven and home, the individual believer, the man or woman who has trust in Christ, will face trials. There'll be days of darkness. There'll be the bitterness of situations and circumstances that arise. And if I expand it out a little bit, it wasn't just Peter that taught this thought. It was also the Apostle James. Remember it says in James chapter 1 and verse 2, My brethren, so he's again speaking to God's people, Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. And the word temptations in the Greek is periasmos. And it's exactly the same word that's mentioned. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, he, he, he mentions at the end, the last word is temptations, manifold temptations, a, a variety of temptations. That the trial of your faith, and the word trial is the same Greek word, periasmos. You see, it, it means a test. It means a temptation. And of course it depends on the context. You see, the trial, the test, can be a negative thing in your life. Or it could have a positive connotation. You're well aware of maybe looking back at the days of school, setting a test, and you either passed the test or you failed. Well, it's same in the um, tests of life. God sends the test so that what is in the heart will be revealed. God sends the test to prove the validity and genuineness 
of our faith. You see, it's the same event. The test. And in the test, there's a temptation. It's sent by God to test us. And as I've said, in the test, there's a temptation. And the devil can use the test or the trial. And remember, he can use it to tempt us to sin against God. And it all depends how we respond to that trial or that test by the grace of God. So so that's why sometimes the, the, the Bible uses the word temptations and also uses the word in the same context, trials. You see, when troubles come, what do we do? How do we respond? Do we become better or do we turn to God in prayer? Do we remain quiet in confidence, as the Bible says, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength? Or do we complain? Do we murmur? Do we lash out at God? Do we remain tender in spirit and compassionate? Or do we become cruel and harsh in our words and our thinking? Do we trust him or turn from him? Do we remain faithful to him or do we become fearful and begin to fret? Do we draw close to him or are we driven from him? You see, the same event, the test, whatever that test is, remember it's manifold temptations. And in that test, there's a temptation to complain, to become bitter against God, to to be driven from him, to, to turn from him. And that trial can produce different results depending on how we react and how we respond to the test. God tests his people using a variety of occasions in life's journey, using a variety of ways. And the Bible teaches us that the Lord takes all whom he loves through different trials. And in the trial, of course, we we don't deny the pain. And in the trial, we don't discourage praise. You see, sometimes people can say, well, you're suffering trials because you've got a lack of faith. There's a problem with your faith. Well, that's not true. Others can say, well, you're suffering and you, you must have a smile on your face. And Sometimes it's very hard to smile when you're hurting. John 16 and 33, the Lord Jesus said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Again, the Bible says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I'm thinking tonight of a woman who's lost her husband. She's left with two children. They're having the funeral service. She's hurting. There's tears in her eyes. She's got grief in her heart. And I'm thinking of a pastor who's at the service not the pastor that's preaching or leading the service. This happened in England, so it didn't happen in Northern Ireland. I just want to add that. So so he bounds down, coming out of the church, takes the woman by the hand, who's a Christian, and, and says this, praise the Lord, sister, he's in heaven. Now that was true. But I, I wonder, what empathy, what, what sympathy did he really have with the woman in her pain and in her grief And in her loss. The people that are addressed. I want you to think secondly. The prospectus that's highlighted. It says that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire. Now. Now, let let me say some things tonight, very, very quickly. Our trials are sent by a loving Heavenly Father. Who sends the trials into our life? Who decides the nature and the ferocity of the trial? And hard it is to understand, the answer is, God himself. A sovereign, loving, heavenly father who's in charge of their lives. They're not by accident. 
They're by design and purpose, and they're all sent under his control. And you see, it's not really for us to decide. It's not really for us to say, well, why me? You think of the the nature of the trial, critical illness, death of a loved one, loss of a job, breakup of a marriage. Isn't that painful? Trouble in the life of the children, financial difficulties. You think of the worry and the stress and strain that that can bring to you and to the family. Intense persecution. And there's places in the world tonight that are suffering intense persecution because of the gospel in Christ. You think of those that face martyrdom. Those that are in the throes of depression like William Cowper whom I've mentioned. It's not only for a 17th century issue, it's a 21st century issue. You think of the withdrawal of his presence and power. And the amazing thing is this, that while it's hard for us to understand, the Lord has allowed this. The Lord permits this. The Lord has ordained this trial. And he's using these trials just as a goldsmith purifies gold. And, and as the goldsmith watches the gold in the furnace with the heat being applied to, to bring the dross away, to purify the gold, so, so God is using these trials and reminding us in the midst of them, I haven't forgotten you. I haven't failed you. I haven't forsaken you. Haven't we got his promise threefold? The threefold cord's not easy broken. I, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't it written of him? Joshua chapter 1, I will not fail you. Therefore, we can be strong. We can have a good courage in the face of trial. And I will not forsake you. And again, in Isaiah 49, that's a very comforting thought. God hasn't forgotten me. I'm graven in the palms of his hand. He thinks upon me daily. He bears me in his shoulders. He has me in his heart. He's not going to forsake me. He's not going to fail me. And yet at the same time, he, he allows, permits, and ordains these strange trials. Another thought that came to mind was that our trials are really brief. If you look at the context, it says, For in you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold or, or multicolored temptations. You see, they're only for a season. A little while. Now, a little while can seem a long time if you're in the furnace. And I think of the testing of metal. I think of gold in the furnace. And I don't know how long it takes. Sometimes the process can be repeated seven, eight, nine times. The goldsmith can be watching the precious metal in the furnace and bring it out and draw off the dross and put it back in again. There's a story told about a man in church, again an English man in an English church, and his pastor said to him, how are you brother? And here was his answer, pastor I'm really falling apart. The pastor says, well that's good because I'm preaching on the subject of trials, and our trials are going to be brief brother. And this was his reply, well they don't seem brief to me. And you see, when you're going through the trial, it doesn't seem brief. But, but what I want you to do is not think of time, but think of eternity. You know, a, a trial can be for a day, a week, a month, a year, ten years. And if you're sitting by the bedside of a loved one, it can seem a long time, especially if they're ill. If your marriage crumbles and falls apart, or your children are in trouble, or you lose your job and you can't pay your bills, and your trials go on and on and on, and it seems to be wave after wave of trial coming, then they don't seem brief. But you see, they're only brief when compared to eternity. Look, look with me at Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm convinced that this is what the Apostle Peter is getting at. 
though now for a season if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, For our light affliction, and if you want to think about the word affliction and what Paul experienced, you have to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, in other words, which is brief, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, they're brief in comparison to eternity. Another little thought that come to mind was this, that our trials are necessary. Martin Luther said, adversity is the best book in my library. You see, it's really proof that we're the Lord's. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Psalm 119, verse 67. He said in verse 71 of the same psalm, It is good for me that I had been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And then he said, And thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. You see, they're necessary to, to prove the genuineness of our faith. I want you to think also our, our trials are painful. Think of this process. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. So you've got to think of the goldsmith. You've got to think of him putting the metals into the crucible. And then he, he applies the heat. Why is he heating up the metal? To, to prove the genuineness of the metal. So suppose somebody come to the goldsmith and brought some things out of his pocket and said, I've got some gold here. How much will you give me? Well, he just doesn't say, well, you know what? I'll, I'll give you so much. No, no, he, he had a way of testing the metal before he handed out any cash. And he tested it by the process of the fire. And, and Peter's saying that we as Christians are subject to this process of trial by fire. Fiery trials come. And the melting process helps to refine the metal. Um, Malachi chapter 3 mentions the refiner sitting by the fire, watching patiently, the, 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 the metal um, dissolving uh, uh, and becoming liquid and, and the dross being taken off to, to purify the metal so that the refiner could see his own face in it. And once he could see his face in it, it was like a mirror, that then he, he, he knew it was genuine and he knew it was the real article. Now, the fire is a painful process. I must confess, I, I don't like fire. I'll tell you something else I don't like. I don't like thorns. Remember Paul, the thorn in the flesh, to buffet me, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. And isn't it painful if you get a thorn in your finger? And uh, I, of course, um, don't, don't like pain, and I want the thorn taken away as quickly as possible. And all these trials that come, they're not only sent by a loving God, they're not only brief in comparison to eternity. They're not only necessary, but they're very painful. And therefore, we've got to have sympathy and enmity one with another. Not only the perspectives that's highlighted, but I want you to think of the purpose that's revealed or the product that's revealed. You see, if you look at verse 7 again, it says that the trial of your faith, the word that goes to the very heart of the message, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. 
here's the purpose. Here's the product that's in view. That the faith that we have is being tested and refined just like the goal is tested and refined to remove the dross and to prove that it's genuine. So there's a contrast here and there's a comparison here. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, our faith is more precious than gold. Do you know why? Because gold is perishable. And faith is not. And uh, of course, gold can't gain heaven for us. All the gold in the world is worthless because we can't buy our way into heaven. And, 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 and faith is more precious than gold because by faith in Christ we have assurance of entrance into heaven. And yet, like the gold, our faith is tested. God doesn't test our faith to make it fail. He tests our faith to prove its genuineness, to, to burn off the dross. You see, there is such a thing as false faith. And, and how many, like the um, parable of the sower and the seed, uh, the, the seed was sown on a certain type of soil and then all of a sudden it sprang up and then when persecutions and afflictions arose because of the word of God, then that person who professed faith in Christ and professed to be saved proved to have a false faith, proved to be just a professor and not a, a genuine possessor. Here's, here's the product that's revealed. The heart of the message. Your faith and mine has been tested and refined to prove it's genuine, to prove its true worth so that it can grow stronger and not weaker in the midst of the trial. Another benefit that we face, if you think of the rest of the text, it says, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, in the trial, we look to the Saviour we, we have faith in him. We hold on to him. Even in the darkness and difficulty of our situation, we have a sure and steadfast hope in him that, that cannot be changed. And, and, we, and we still love him. Even though these bad things are happening that we don't have answers to and, and can't understand. And we're, we're wondering how this can benefit us. How is this for our good? The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, and to them are the called according to his purpose. And, and you see, as our faith is proved to be genuine, here, here's one of the aspects. Here's one of the spin-offs. It strengthens us in the place of prayer. How, how many believers find difficulty in the place of prayer? Maybe even have a period of prayerlessness. Maybe have not prayed at all, and then a trial comes. And what, what does it do? It drives us to our knees. And we cry out to God for help. And we draw near to the Lord. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But when affliction came, now I've kept thy word. See, that's why he could say, thou unfaithfulness has afflicted me. Job 23 verse 14 talks about the trial being appointed. It brings home to our heart the preciousness of the word of God. In the trial, we can get a word from God. I was reading just, um, it was yesterday or today, about a man in America whose house burnt down. And uh, that was a great trial. Imagine coming home from work and somebody has told you, well, your house has burnt down, the fire begins there. And when they searched through all the rubble, what did they find in the fire? They, they found a nugget of gold and they discovered that that man's house was actually built on the edge of a gold mine and he became a very wealthy individual. You see, in the trial you can get a nugget of gold, get a word from God, a word that you can hold on to. In the trial you can be a, a witness and testimony to others. Your, your, your trial can, can benefit others. You, you can help them to just come through what, what you're coming through. It's also a testimony to every unsaved individual. It's not only for the good of others and the good of your own soul, but it's for the glory of God. I tell you this as we finish. When Patrick Hamilton was being martyred in Scotland, 
someone said as they were burning him at the stake, don't burn any more martyrs publicly. Put them to death in prison because the smoke of Hamilton's fire has opened the eyes of thousands. You see, the trial of your faith can be found unto the praise and the honour and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, Christ can become more precious to your own soul. You, you can draw near to him in prayer. You can get a word from him despite the serity of the trials. Think of the three friends, Daniel's three friends in the furnace of affliction in Daniel um, 5. Uh, and, and there was one like unto the Son of Man with them in the very furnace of affliction. That's what the Lord does. And here's the product that's being revealed. There's a purpose in this trial. Or these trials, fiery as they are, necessary, painful, brief, sent by God. Here's the purpose. To prove the genuineness of your faith. So that your soul can benefit. So that others can benefit. And so that God ultimately is glorified. May the Lord take these few thoughts and bless them to your understanding tonight. I know I've only scratched on the surface. Let's remember to pray one for another in the pain and the difficulty of all our trials.